these birthday conferences, I guess you're supposed to say something about the, the uh, person being honored. And um, to be honest with you, compared to all of the other, many of the other speakers at this conference, I have a uh, looser connection to Doug uh, than, than others. So I'm not exactly sure why I was invited, but um, I'm happy to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, I started my career uh, in more abstract subjects and model categories, and over the years have evolved into more computational direction in a direction that is more similar to Doug's taste. And in fact, uh, that evolution is uh, culminating in a joint publication that will be uh, that will be coming sometime soon. So I actually am a, a co-author to to be. Um, so I guess that's some sort of some connection. All right. So I'm going to talk today. Oh, I guess, and I guess the title is also sort of a, a certain, a pays homage to one of Doug's books. I'm referring to nilpotence and, um, and periodicity. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about some phenomena in motivic stable homotopy groups. And the first of all, let's just get this out of the way. So I'm going to be almost exclusively talking about the prime two. And everything is completed at the prime two, and I'm not going to bother to do any of that in the notation or to say that sort of you know over and over again. But certainly we're working um, at at two. Okay, so let's start with uh, well, actually, wait a minute. Maybe there's another introduction. There was one more thing I wanted to. Oh yeah, right. So um, this might be kind of a kind of a funny talk in that um, most of what I'm going to say is sort of looking at data and making observations from the data that in hindsight were actually really obvious sort of once you, you know, um, you say in hindsight, but weren't so obvious in advance. And also I will state there, there are some theorems that have, you know, real uh, proofs, that, you know, actual uh, substantive proofs in the talk, but they're mostly due to other people and I'm just going to sort of state the theorems and not really get into those, those details. Okay. So, um, and so, all right, so let's get started here. Okay, so there's a theorem, and then maybe this is due to Nishida. Okay, so, so let's let alpha be some element of some stable homotopy group. And suppose that al that 2 to the n times alpha is 0 for some n. Okay? So this alpha is torsion. Okay? Now I'm stating this kind of strangely, right? Because I could simply just say, suppose that alpha is in pi n and n is greater than 0, right? Because the only torsion is in pi 0, right? But I'm stating it this way because later it'll make more sense to, to say it this way. Okay? So then alpha is nilpotent. Okay? So that's the theorem. And uh, uh, that's in such sort of starting point for the talk. So I guess the first question that someone with my interest would ask is, um, what is the motivic analog of this statement? Right? Is it true that motivic stable homotopy groups also have this? Uh, this the same kind of Nishida nilpotence. Okay, so let's look at some data. All right, and the data is up here. Uh, some of the data is up here on this chart. This chart is an E2 page of the atom spect of the motivic atom spectral sequence for C. Okay, so when I say motivic, I think today I'm almost always talking about motivic over the complex numbers. Anyway, so this is a this is an E2 page. There are some blue lines out towards the right that are Adams differentials. But we don't even need to get that far. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning. When you look at the first three stems, everything looks the same. And then when you get to the fourth stem, you see this red dot and an arrow going up to the right. Okay? And what's happening there is that the element H1, normally we think of you know, H1 cubed equals H0 squared H2 in the three stem, and then, then H1 to the fourth and higher are zero. Right? That's saying that eta to the fourth is zero in homotopy. Okay, that's not happening here. Right? That, that red dot and that arrow indicates an infinite tower of, of, of elements in the Adams E2 page, in the motivic Adams E2 page. Okay? And so the answer is no. And there's this element eta in pi 111 
is not is not nilpotent. Okay. Um, so this is you, I'm showing you this in algebra in X, but in fact there are no atoms differentials interfering here, and this all survives to infinity. Okay. And now, you know, I'm not going to talk about the background of motivic homotopy theory today because I want to do stuff and not kind of do the background. And um, let me point out here for those of you who aren't so familiar with this, you know, I've got two gratings here. Okay, so one of the one of the features of motivic homotopy theory is that it has this extra grading. This is sort of this enrichment of classical homotopy theory, much like equivariant homotopy theory is an enrichment of classical homotopy theory. And one of those aspects is that it has extra grading. And that's the uh, that that's the sort of thing that's going on here. Okay. All right, so that eta is not nilpotent, okay? So rats, the, the obvious statement of the theorem is, is, uh, is false on the nose, okay? So there might be some um, way to salvage this, right? So let's, you know, can we, can we try to see what's going wrong here? What's, uh, is, is there some, you know, some obvious reason why eta was allowed to be not nilpotent? Okay, so one thing that you might think about is the fact that um, eta, has no topological dimension. Okay, and so what I mean here is that um, th this, this sort of one is referring to kind of like the total dimension of the class, like A days in pi one, and the second one is referring to kind of how much, how, how algebraically twisted the element is. And so it's as twisted as it kind of could be, and there isn't any kind of trivial topological dimension sitting around in there. So from some perspectives and from some gradings on, in motivic homotopy, this eta is actually kind of in a zero stem in a sense, okay, because of that, all right? So that might be the problem, right? The problem might be simply that eta is in the zero stem and elements of the zero stem are allowed to be non-nilpotent, right? It should be elements in higher stems uh, that should have the nilpotents, okay? So, um, that's a plausible that's a plausible guess as to what's uh, as to what's going on but that doesn't work either because there's an element mu 9 in pi 9 5 detected by ph1 and i guess you can see that on the chart that uh well, on the ninth stem you can't really there's a sort of a second kind of triangular shape at the top and it's that left um, lower left corner of that triangle here i can move the cursor right it's right it's right below the cursor there. Okay, there's pH one. This guy turns out to also be um, is not nilpotent. Okay, and that guy's not. It does have top of nine minus five is four, right? It has it says four of these sort of topological dimensions going on there. So that doesn't explain it. Okay. Actually, you can even look at all of these guys. Um, these mu a k plus one in pi a k plus one four k plus one. Uh, and these are all detected by these elements p to the k h1 up along the top of the uh, of the atoms chart. All of these guys are also not nilpotent. Okay, so we're going to try to build a theory that you know some, some notion of nilpotence that makes sense. We're going to have to account for all of these guys. Okay, and um, well, there's a couple observations here about these, these, these examples that we've produced so far just by looking at the data. Um, first of all, these are all image of J guys, okay? And so maybe the image of J is somehow an exception, right? Okay, so image of J, you know, which we totally understand anyway, maybe that's the nilpotence, and maybe things outside of the image of J are still nilpotent, okay? And the other thing that you might observe about these eight, um, these, um, these, 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 these new 8K plus ones, is that they all support infinite eta towers, okay? So if you look at each of these guys, they have these red arrows that go up off of them, okay? And so another possible guess, is, um, is so, so let's let alpha be, belong to some motivic homotopy group, and let's suppose that it's torsion and let's also suppose that it's sort of eta torsion in the sense that it's annihilated by some power of eta, right? And then you might yeah, ask, maybe is, is that enough to show that alpha is nilpotent, okay? And that kind of feels right somehow. Somehow in motivic homotopy, you know, there, there's, so eta behaves differently, but, but 
it, that, and that's sort of the source of a lot of interesting stuff, but it, it somehow it's the most fundamental difference and, and everything else maybe propagates from this difference with eta. This is a kind of a, a plausible guess. It was plausible enough that I asked a student to try to prove this, okay? Um, and the student kept getting stuck, and it turns out that there was a reason that the student kept getting stuck, which is that it's not true, okay? So, I mean, I'm calling this a theorem, but as I say, this is an ex example of how, like, this is just an observation. When you know what you're looking for in the data and you finally see it, and then it's sort of all going to be very, very, uh, very clear in hindsight. Okay, so what happens here? I'm going to scroll out a little bit away right here. Okay, so right, right there, right, right there, there's this element labeled D1 that you can't read, but anyway, it's called D1. Okay, so the theorem is that there exists an element, and I'll call it kappa 1. Kappa is the name that usually associated with D0, and so I'm going to call kappa 1 the element associated with D1. Okay, so there's a kappa 1 in pi 32, 18. Uh, it's in the 32 step, okay? Uh, so it's detected by D1. Um, and this guy... This guy, it turns out, is not nil potent. Okay? So this is sort of bad, right? Because when you see this guy, and what the hell is he doing there, and how else are you going to, there's going to be other examples, and it just looks like, kind of like the whole theory is just blowing up, and, uh, and, and um, motivic homotivity groups just are sort of like, just qualitatively different than classical groups, and that there's sort of no, no chance to make sense of it. Um, and anyway, so it was, it, this is actually kind of discouraging when we kind of realize this, this fact in a certain sense. But, you know, as a couple of years have gone by and now we're starting to see the structure, and that's what the rest of this talk is about, is sort of what this kind of, this observation kind of led us to, uh, led, led us to actually work out, okay? So let me talk about the proof of this theorem because, as I said, it's actually pretty easy, okay? So the first thing is that if, so I'm going to call XC, this is the E2 page of the motivic atom spectral sequence. Uh, let me put this C down here. Okay, and I grade things a little bit idiosyncratically from the way that is usually done historically. So my X groups are labeled S for stem, F for atmosphere filtration, and then W for the weight, the motivic weight. So that one, but, but I use S and F Whereas traditionally people would use like T minus S for the stem and then S for F. But, you know, look at the chart. Go over S, go up F, Cartesian coordinates. Like that's the way we look at the dots and that's the way that the notation should be. Anyway, so I'm going to label things that way. Okay. So, um, so if it turns out, and these, these are, th these um, facts are relatively easy to prove from, from just from looking at the algebra. Okay. So first of all, these X groups are concentrated in degrees where S plus F minus 2W has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, this follows, like if you say, if you look at the May spectral sequence, all the generators of the May spectral sequence satisfy this, so who cares what the differentials do? It's still concentrated in those degrees. Okay, and, and there's sort of an edge case here that if you look at these groups, Right in the degrees where S plus F minus 2W equals zero, then what you get is an isomorphism to the classical X groups and the degree with a kind of a funny degree shift, which isn't that important. Okay? And again, this just comes out of algebra. Say if you look at the May spectral sequences in these degrees, they're isomorphic and everything just works out, works out fine. Okay? So that's the um, that's kind of like the algebraic kind of underpinning of this of this proof. All right, and then D1, the element D1 that I'm talking about, the motivic element, you know, motivic D1 corresponds to classical D0. Okay, under this isomorphism, if you check the degrees, 32 comma 4 comma 18, and you check this, it comes out to be 14 comma 4. It's right where it, it, it's supposed to occur. Okay, and so D0. In the classical X groups, is not nilpotent, and this is just an algebraic fact. Okay, this is not about homotopy. I'm just saying in X, in the algebra, in the Adams E2 page, 
this element d0 is not nilpotent, okay? And you can compute this in, um, this is detected in the cohomology, say, of A of 2, right? The thing that you use, you know, that you use to study TMS, okay? So you can see that this d0 is not nilpotent, okay? And then therefore, d1, using this isomorphism, d1 is not nilpotent in motivic X. Okay, D1 is nilpotent in, oh, I, guess I don't actually know that. I was going to say D1 is nilpotent in, in classical X, but I guess I don't know that. It's probably true. But anyway, D1, the point of this is that D1 is not nilpotent in classical X. Okay, so that's, so, so this is, again, this is still all just algebra. Okay, um, this doesn't get you very far, right? Because you have to know about Adam's differentials. Right? And this is a big problem, right? How do you know that d1 to the 29th power is, is not zero? Right? I mean, that's, you know, way out in high, high steps, right? How could, maybe there could be some differential coming, okay? So, there's two things you have to worry about with the Adams differentials. You have to worry about Adams differentials going out, right? And Adams differentials coming in, right? Hitting it. Okay, so first of all, so the two things. First of all, d1, um, is a permanent cycle. by brute force, okay? If you just carry out an analysis of the atom spectral of the motivic atom spectral sequence out to the 32 stem and you analyze all the possible differentials and you figure out what's going on, you find that D1 is a permanent cycle, okay? So, so far, so good. And so therefore, all the powers of D1 are permanent cycles, okay? So you don't have to worry about any differentials coming out. These guys all survive, right? And the other thing you have to argue is um, that there are no atoms differentials hitting it no atoms differentials hitting d1 to the k. And that just comes from basic degree reasons. Okay, What happens to an atoms differential is that it increases this quantity, this s plus f minus 2w. And so um, d1 is in degree, is s plus f minus 2w is 0. Differentials would have to have a source in negative degrees, and there isn't anything in negative degrees, and so there just aren't any possible differentials. Okay, so that's it. So it actually turns out it's an entirely algebraic proof, and you know it's it's all pretty obvious once you sort of know that that's what you were looking for, right? Okay. All right. So, um, and you know I should say that there are more examples of this type. Now that you know about about D1, you can find similar examples in the in the um, anyway in, in higher stem. But this is the lowest stem example, and it's probably the lowest stem of these kind of weird examples. Okay, so we need some, if we're going to go further now, we're actually going to need to kind of step back and figure out what's going on. We don't even have a guess as to what the steer, the, the version of sort of Nishida Nilpotent should even be here. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about is, I, this is part two. I don't think I wrote down part one. Part one was Nishida Nilpotence. Right. Okay, part two, so this is cofiber of tau. Okay, so um, what is this? All right, so there's an element in pi zero comma minus one. Okay, so this is in this is the motivic version of you know what what we think of as the zero stem. Okay, so on an Adams chart, it would be all the way on the left side in the very leftmost column. Okay, but it has this kind of like this funny algebraic twist to it. Okay, so there's an element called tau. Okay, and it is detected by um, an element tau in the motivic cohomology of a point, which turns out to be F2 a joint tau. Okay, so this tau is in Adams filtration zero, right? It's actually detected in our already in cohomology direct. Okay? So there's this co this this there's this funny guy. Okay? And we know a lot about this this element tau. Um, well, I mean, there it is, right? But uh, in terms of nilpotence, so there is an a one another. So one of these obvious turns out in hindsight, kind of these obvious propositions, and this is due to Achim Krause, who actually sort of noticed this. Okay, so let's let alpha belong to some motivic stable motivic homotopy group. 
Okay? And then alpha is nilpotent if and only if um, some alpha to the n is zero in the tau localization of the monotypic stable homotopy groups and is zero in the stable monotypic homotopy groups of the cofiber of tau. Okay? This is a the proof of this is totally straightforward. If alpha n maps to zero here, that means that alpha n equals tau to the k times beta. If alpha n maps to zero here, it means it's divisible by tau, and you put these formulas together algebraically, and you just work it out, and it, and, and the answer comes out. Okay, so this is this is not um, this is not sort of a, a deep result, but it, it points you in the right direction. Okay, so this thing here. This is just the classical situation. Okay? It is a theorem that the tau localization of cellular stable motivic homotopy is just classical homotopy. So talking about what something is or isn't in here or computing in here, it's just computing classically. Okay? So, um, so that's the first. That's, that's the, uh, that, that part is sort of like understood and, and captured by Nishida and, you know, and, and, and so forth. Okay? But, What's going on in here is this cofiber of tau is is something that we have to uh, we have to study. Okay. Um, now, I notice I, I stated this this proposition kind of carefully. I did not say that alpha is nilpotent in in the state motivic the motivic stable homotopy groups if and only if it is nilpotent in this ring and nilpotent in this ring. Right. I didn't say that because. I don't even know that this is a ring, right? This is a homotopy of a, of a two-cell complex, right? That's not the thing that doesn't usually look like a ring, okay? So, um, so that, so I guess we should write that down, right? So, is this thing right? Is it even a ring? Right is is one question, and then you could talk about whether you know then the alpha n goes to alpha to the n, and you can actually talk about nilpotent say in that in that range or something. Okay, all right. So this is this this cofiber of tau is sort of a funny guy that we've been looking at um, recently for a lot of different reasons, and I'm motivating it here today from the perspective of of nilpotence, but there as I say, there are lots of other reasons to be looking at this thing. Okay, one of the curious facts about this guy. Is that the Adams Novikov spectral sequence for S mod tau collapses? Okay, and so what this means is that the homotopy groups of the cofiber of tau, they're just the same, equal isomorphic to the you know the usual the cohomology of this you know the usual BP star BP hop algebra. Okay, so this is already a pretty remarkable statement, right? Look, I'm saying that here is this purely algebraic guy here, right? Which is that's a hard computation, but it's a purely algebraic thing, right? So just about BP star BP cohomodules or whatever. And over here is a two cell complex which appears to have some sort of homotopical role to play, right? And I'm saying that its homotopy groups, right, are entirely algebraic. Okay, and the reason is simply that the spectral sequence collapses. There's no room for differentials when you take the weights into account. There's no room for differentials, and that, the fact that this spectral sequence collapses, um, is uh, is really due to uh, to who, Creech and Ormsby. Although I, I don't think that that statement uh, was made by them, but but it, they did the work in computing the degrees of all the elements in the adams novikov spectral sequence, so that this observation then then follows immediately. Okay. All right. So now, okay. So now, anyway, this thing is a ring because this guy on the right is a ring, and so that makes it a ring, right? But that's just not a very satisfying kind of kind of answer, right? The real question here is whether S mod tau is a ring, right? So there's a theorem of Bogdan Jorge that S mod tau is 
an E infinity ring spectrum. Okay? Now, um, one should be a little bit careful about this theorem, okay? Because I'm talking about a motivic spectrum, and when I say E infinity, I mean sort of like the naive E, inf in sense of e infinity, okay? So I don't, I am not claiming, and I don't know that this is true, although I suspect that it is, but I don't know that it's true whether S mod tau is a strictly commutative ring spectrum. Just like in the equivariant situation, naive E infinity is not the same as strictly commutative. You need a fancier operad to understand strictly commutativity and strict commutativity. And the same thing um, ought to happen motivically, although I don't think we know what that operad is motivically. But anyway, I want to be just careful about that point, and then that, that's an interesting problem to actually settle whether this thing is strictly commutative or not. But anyway, it is a ring, okay? Um, and in that sense, anyway, okay? So now I can talk about, the point of this is that I can now talk about nilpotence in the homotopy of S mod tau. Okay, and this is a little bit of, of an aside, but let me just say this, uh, th th this sort of interesting related facts also. See, when, one of the things about this isomorphism is that, you know, these, this, this cohomology of this Hopf algebra, this is the endomorphisms of BP star in the category of BP star BP co-modules. Okay? And this is the endomorphisms of S mod tau in the category of S mod tau modules. So there's sort of it, so there's sort of an object in a homotopic category for which this is the endomorphisms, and there's an object in a homotopic category for which this is the endomorphisms. And what that suggests is a theorem that there's actually sort of a more structured version of this, which is that the homotopy category of S mod tau modules is equivalent to some derived category of BP star BP co-modules, okay? And then let me just sort of brush this off with suitable finiteness conditions. You need bounded this and finite that and T structure or whatever, but to make it precise. But roughly speaking, it turns out that the category of S mod tau modules is the same as the derived category of BP star BP co-modules. Okay, so this is a really kind of, this is a really weird sort of thing, right? That you have this algebraic category on the right side, and it's equivalent to what looks like a more sort of topological homotopical thing. Okay, um, but one of the things that it allows you to do is is compute better. Okay, um, one of the um, one of the corollaries of this equivalence of categories is that, to, to give you an example of how this allows you to compute, because, you know, here's this homotopical thing and there's this algebraic thing that's much easier to compute with, is that the the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence is the same as the Adams spectral sequence for S mod tau. Okay? The algebraic Novikov spectral sequence is an algebraic spectral sequence that converges to the cohomology of this Hopf algebra. Okay? And the Adams spectral sequence for Kohlmuffer tau is a spectral sequence that converges to this thing on the left, the homotopy groups of S mod tau. And it turns out that those spectral sequences are actually the same. That under this equivalence, filtration that you use for the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence corresponds to the Adams filtration that you use for the Adams spectral sequence over there. Okay? And the result is that the, the algebraic Novikov spectral sequence being entirely algebraic is something that's amenable to computer calculation. And then those computer calculations give you information about Adams spectral sequences. Okay? So this is where I get to respond to um, Steve's, um, Steve's um, 
philosophizing earlier about how what is it good for, right? Find the applications, right? Okay. So the applications of all this. Uh, so, so the upshot is that we can we can use a computer to get all of these atoms differentials for cofiber of tau, and from cofiber of tau you can use the inclusion of the bottom cell and the map the, the projection of the top cell to compare to the sphere, and you can use that to deduce atoms differentials for the sphere from atoms differentials for the cofiber of tau. Okay, and the upshot of all of this is that. We have, in the last year, we have obtained 30 new classical stable steps, okay? Roughly speaking, from the range 62 to 93, okay? Um, and the method is not exhausted yet, which is just as far as we've gotten in, in processing and, and, and working through the data, okay? All right, that's, this is an aside, actually. Um, it's not really one I want to talk about today, although, obviously, we could go on. Um, there is lots to say about that, but not today. Okay, so um, not having really answered anything about motivic nilpotence, except having um, shown you what the lay of the land is and what the problems are, let me move on to motivic periodicities. Okay, so Haynes Miller suggested the following program. Okay, he said, look, start with this non nilpotent element eta, okay, and let's call it W0, okay, and that notation is supposed to be related to V0, right? Uh, and we should be thinking here as we talk this through, we'll think through the classical story. Like classically, you would start with the non nilpotent element 2, which is V0. Okay? But now we're going to start with eta, which is W0. Okay? And then you should find a W1 self map. And it turns out that the degrees are what they are. But you look at the cofiber of eta. And you should find a W1 to the fourth self map. Okay? And this is just like what happens classically. You start with 2, V0, and you, you find V1 to the fourth from the cofiber of 2 to itself. Okay? And then after you do that, then you should keep going and you should find a W2 self map. On the next cofiber, and keep going. Okay. So uh, what 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 Haynes was really saying here is let's try to replay the classical story, except except starting from the in two and building up, looking at cofibers and building up these other periodicities. Let's start with eta, right, and build up these other periodicities. Okay. Um, there are all kinds of. Um, problems here. Well, okay, so first of all, let me say that um, this part, Michael Andrews did this basically immediately as soon as sort of like Miller suggested this should be done. You sit down and just do it and it works out great. Okay. Um, but there are some like, you know, vague, there's some vagueness in this. Like, what do we mean by W1? What do we mean by W2? What do we mean by the higher WNs? Right? So, um, What, is, what do we mean by this? Well, one thing we might mean, one way to actually de to define a W and self map is we need versions of Morava K, K theory, right? So classically, a VN self map is a map that's detected in Morava K theory, all right? And so 
we might need some suitable version, some, something like Morava K theory, except not for the VNs, for these you know, so-called WNs, okay? Um, and it turns out that, uh, the, that some of this is, is possible, okay? And this is what I'm gonna talk about next. All right, so let me get into a little more detail here. That's uh, not really a recollection. Okay, so let me just say what the motivic Steenrod algebra actually is. The motivic Steenrod, or the dual, right? I guess this is the dual, okay? So what is the, uh, the dual motivic uh, Steenrod algebra? All right, so you first of all, you start off with the cohomology of a point, which is F2 adjoined to, I guess that showed up briefly somewhere up there, right? Okay, so you start with the cohomology of a point, and then you adjoin some generators, and then you adjoin some more generators, and you mod out by the relation tau i squared equals tau ci plus one. Okay, so um, first thing you should do with this formula is you could, should compare it to the classical Steenrod algebra. In the classical Steenrod algebra, you just have one family of polynomial generators. Okay? And if you take this formula and you ignore that tau, then that's what you get here, really. You don't really need the Ci plus ones because they're decomposable and you just get a polynomial in the tau i's. Okay? So this is, uh, this is a deformation in, in the sense of inserting this tau here of the, of the classical um, Steenrod algebra. And you can see how it happens when I'm talking about inverting tau is the classical story, you can see that here as well. If you invert tau, then you really just do get the classical Steenrod algebra, okay? Um, but that's not what we want to do, as we pointed out um, over here, where we, uh, what we really want to think more about is S mod tau. Because that's where the sort of interesting exotic phenomena are occurring. Okay, right, so what we really want to do is look at, well, let's call it sort of A bar, okay? And by A bar, I mean if you take the motivic eilenberg maclean object and you uh, take the cofiber of tau on that, you look at self maps, well, I guess I don't want that either, right? I really want... Um, the smash product over S mod tau, since I'm talking about the dual. I guess I really want that thing, right? Um, and I guess I want its homotopy groups too. Okay, so what does this look like if you mod out, uh, the effect of doing all this on al in algebra is simply modding out by tau. Okay, if you go through the definitions and you're careful with all the cofiber sequences and everything, that's all that, 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 that's all that happens, okay? And the result, then you get F2, uh, well, you get an exterior algebra on the taus and polynomial on the xis, right? It sort of splits into these two pieces, and, um, which makes it easier to study. Okay, and then another theorem of Bogdan Gheorghe, is that there exist, and again, these are E infinity S mod tau algebras, but not necessarily strictly commutative, right? Because these are motivic objects again, but they're E infinity um, S mod tau modules, or S mod tau algebras, um, with what? And we'll call them little k of Wn, okay? So these are the, um, the versions of connective Morava K theory for these WNs rather than for the VNs. So you would call, the, you traditionally write K of N for, for what in this notation would be K of VN, but we gotta do something different here, so that's what we'll do right, for the notation, okay? So, um, and they have exactly the right um, comp computational properties that the cohomology 
of these guys. Uh, is that what I, well, I guess I really want that sort of like that mod tau cohomology. Uh, hang on a second, let me, a bar, um, mod mod exterior on Pn, where Pn is dual to, uh, I think there's a degree shift, yeah, Cn plus one. Okay, and I should have said here that then h bar is this h f2 mod tau. Anyway, the point is that um, classically, what you have, the cohomology of these Morava K theories looks like the Steenrod algebra modulo some exterior, uh, some exterior class. And uh, it, I guess in this notation, the, 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 the Morava K theories are like the, the Steenrod algebra modulo the exterior on the, what would be the tau ends, I guess, over here. But here we've got the, the dual, the dual to the tau ends. So we've got the dual to the Cs. Anyway, it's this, this turns out to be exactly what we want, okay? So, um, just to, to point out, so for example, the homotopy of these things is F2 adjoin the class Wn, okay? And um, what else? Um, you can actually, um, you can actually assemble them all together, there exist, um, you can assemble them all together. There exists a thing that Bogdan calls WBP because it's like BP, plays the role of BP except for these Ws, uh, in the sense that you can, in the sense that their homotopy is all of these Ws put together in one big polynomial algebra. Okay, and then the third thing I'll say is that you can then define big K of Wn, the periodic guy to simply be the colimit of multiplication by Wn, and then you get something whose homotopy is F2 adjoined Wn plus or minus 1, and this thing is a graded field. Okay? So this is a sort of an exotic example of a graded field, right? Classically, the Morava K theories are the only sort of fields, right? This is kind of like this is the kind of the, the key sort of principles in, in sort of classical uh, periodicity, right? And what we've got here, hands on here, right, is an example is is an example of sort of an exotic example here. Okay? So um, the way Bogdan does this is to, is to simply build this thing up in the homotopy category of cofiber tau modules by hand, checking the obstructions as you, as you build up the, I guess it's I got the postic of tau, you check the obstructions, and the obstructions all land in groups that happen to be zero, and so there are no obstructions and the whole thing exists. Okay? So the proof is actually pretty easy because all the obstruction groups are zero, right? And there's sort of a philosophical reason why the proof here is, is not so bad, because you know, we're, we sort of, he, Jorge, he's working with S mod tau modules, but he's also really just working with BP star BP co modules. So in some sense, he's really just doing algebra, right? And these kinds of constructions and operations in algebra tend to be easier than in topology, right? And, and so it's not a, um, it's not a surprise, right? Um, but anyway, um, so, so there exist these Morava K theories, right? These, well, I shouldn't, you know, there exist these, these exotic K theories that play the role of Morava K theory, I guess, is maybe the right way to say it. You know, I should say that the, the, the Morava K theories, the things associated with the VNs, are also in this picture. They are sitting here in motivic homotopy theory, just like they do, uh, they do classically in, de and, and in detecting VN periodicity. Okay, so great. So there's these W, there's these, w, these, these K of WNs, and they're going to lead to, um, periodicity, periodic families, and, and stable homotopy groups, and so forth, which need to be analyzed, and that is work that hopefully over the next, over the coming years will will be fleshed out. Okay, um, but uh, 
and and I and, and I know there's lots of details to be filled in here. I'm not saying oh the story with the WNs is all finished and it's all a nice neatly packaged theorem. There's a lot more work to be done, but you can kind of see maybe how it's going to play out. You know, it uh, because these things exist and they're going to have to be taken into account. Um, have we found? all of the periodicities, right? Are there any other phenomena that we're going to have to account for other than these 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 WNs that that Haynes Miller suggested ought to exist, okay? And the answer is no, not yet. And so this is a theorem of mocking Krause that for i greater than or equal to j there exists, a, these are S mod tau modules, or you could think of them as derived BP star BP co modules if you wanted to. There exist S mod tau modules, and let's call them K of HIJs. Um, these HIJs are referring to the HIJs of the atoms of the May spectral sequence, if, if you know what that is. But uh, again, we need more notation here. We're sort of uh, the letter after V and W and X, but you run out of letters soon, and so you need a second subscript, right? But anyway, so the, the, there exists these same kind of things. Um, and let me emphasize that these are actually not rings. Okay? Uh, but anyway, um, but their cohomology, or their reduced, their mod tau cohomology is exactly what you want them to be there the um, the mod tau steel rod algebra modulo an exterior class on a pij where pij is dual to ci to the J minus one, something like that. Okay. Um, these things, the same kind of argument works. You can build this thing up sort of from a postica perspective. You can see that the obstructions have to lie in zero groups and so therefore they must be zero. But it turns out that the obstruction to being a rings are not zero and so that, that's what makes them uh, that, and that's what leads to this this observation here, okay? But never so 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 there are these guys, okay? So they're not rings, but um, their homotopy is so their homotopy isn't going to be, I mean, isn't going to be a ring, right? But it turns out that what it is is a um, is a rank one free module over so what you want okay I I mean it's little, maybe a little bit silly to be distinguishing between a rank one free module and a ring itself right but it, it this thing doesn't come equipped with a multiplication right and so it, it you have to be a little careful about this but anyway it's sort of you know it's sort of what you want right and then you can then similarly you can define um, you can define big K HIJ in the same way with a co-limit of multiplications by HIJ. Okay, so there's all these things, and then it's not quite any pair of indices. You have to have I greater than or equal to J, but um, and then when when uh, when I is less than J, then those obstructions to building the thing don't vanish and they don't. Now, one of the big mysteries here is that um, some of the HIJs can be combined. Okay, for example, you can build, you can take H21 and you can take H22 and you can put them together and build a single. A, a single object, a single um, S mod tau module. 
this H21, this is the same as W1. That's just W1 in a different notation. This H22 is just, I don't know, if you wanted to give it a, a letter, you'd call it X or something, right? But, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, you can do this, okay? And this one in particular, um, you know, and so its homotopy is polynomial in two variables. Um, that is dimension 5 and um, that is dimension 11, yes. Okay. And then they also have weights, right? And so actually, you know, in dimension 55, they're actually not in the same phi degree. Okay. And so as that's, which is an important point because then you can also do this. Okay. And then this is, turns out to be F2 adjoin h21 plus or minus 1, h22 uh, plus or minus 1. This is a graded field because it turns out from the by degrees, uh, there's, there's only one monomial in any given degree. Uh, yes. So this one is 5 comma 3 and this one is 11 comma 6. Okay. Um, now, the reason that I want to... Um, the, the reason I want to point out this particular exact example is I want to go back now to this guy D1 in pi 32, well, kappa 1, I guess I called it. Okay? It turns out that on this K of H21, H22, multiplication by kappa 1 is... Multiplication by h21 squared, h22 squared. Okay, so this non-nilpotent kappa one that we sort of started to talk about, you know, half an hour ago or more, it actually is detected by this thing here. Okay, what we don't know what is how. So okay, and so what I think is that these these k of hijs are basically telling us what the whole story is. What what I don't know, and and yet, and I don't really have a clear formulation, is how these different periodicities can combine and coexist, right? So one of the key pieces in the classical story is that you only have one periodicity at a time on any finite complex, and that's not that doesn't seem to be happening here, right? We can combine these different periodicities and they can coexist, and I don't quite know how to account for that yet, but it doesn't feel intractable. It just feels like we haven't quite wrapped our heads around what the issues are. Okay. Um, that one actually is a ring spectrum. Yeah. The individual KHIJs are known to not be ring spectra. But sometimes when you combine them, see, it's a question of whether these qu quotients, you know, have enough sort of Hopf algebra structure or not. And so if you put more in, you quotient, but you can get a Hopf algebra. That's roughly speaking the idea. All right, so I want to, in the last few minutes here, I want to throw out kind of a, a barely related idea because I think it's, it's very intriguing. Um, so I was, I mean, I've been talking about these problems, you know, involving the motivic schema algebra for years and how this sort of little, this sort of relatively straightforward deformation of the steamer algebra leads to all this rich structure and, and, and so forth. And um, Peter Teichner asked me, well, like if this deformation of the steamer algebra was so great, well, are there other deformations of steamer algebra that would sort of be even better or, or do different things? And um, it took me a while to wrap my head around sort of what might happen. But here is what I, I think would be sort of a very, uh, there would be sort of an interesting story if something like this were to occur. Okay, so first of all, the classical dual steamer algebra is just polynomial in these tau i's. Okay, and let me just write this down again. The, the motivic one, you have the taus, and then you introduce the xis, and you mod out by this little, the, this relation that makes them not quite polynomial. Okay, and then what I 
would like to look at, look, what I would like to look for, okay, is a homotopy theory, okay? And I don't, personally, I don't really care that much about the geometric content of that homotopy theory because I want to compute with it, but that would probably be interesting also. I would like to have a theory in which the dual Steenward algebra um, would look like this. So we got the tau as before, and let's add a new generator omega, and that's kind of like the, the ground ring, okay? And then we'll have the tau as before, and the xes as before, and another family of thetas as before, okay? And mod out by the same relation, tau i squared equals tau xi plus one, and also kind of take it to the next level, instead of just letting it now be polynomial in the xi's, let's add another wrinkle to the xi's, okay? Um, can we have a situation where xi plus one squared is theta, uh, sorry, omega times theta i plus two, okay? So I don't know whether such a, such a homo, whether, a, whether there exists a homotopy theory in which that is the, the steamer algebra or something like that, okay? But um, in such a theory, new, would be not nilpotent, okay? Nu would be detected by um, theta two, I guess, this first theta two, and it, and it would it would end up being not nilpotent, okay? So, um, well, one one way in which you could build evidence for the existence of this you know, possibility is to look for homotopy theories in which nu is not nilpotent, okay? And I recently realized this and it's sort of like the most obvious naive construction, and maybe everyone else sort of you know already knew this, but it turns out that in C2 cross C2 equivariant homotopy, nu is not nilpotent. Okay, so. This, like, this lends strong evidence. I'm not saying that, it, it's certainly not the case that this is the Steenrod algebra in C2 cross C2 equivariant homotopy. What happens in C2 equivariant, C2 cross C2 equivariant homotopy will be much more complicated than this, okay? And that's kind of, um, and that's kind of a problem. So let me kind of end with just like this one comparison. You see, what happens is that you've got C2 homotopy theory. And that C-motivic homotopy theory has all this rich stuff that we've been talking about today. And it is strictly less complicated than our motivic homotopy theory. And our motivic homotopy theory is strictly less complicated than C2 equivariant homotopy theory. Okay? And so what, what, what should happen is over here, there's C2 cross C2 equivariant. And over here, is really the things that I'm looking for because these things would be much more computationally tractable. This is too much. We're biting off too much more than we can chew here by trying to dive into this and trying to compete with this. Okay. And somewhere in here, there is C2 equivariant C motivic homotopy theory, which has been studied a little bit by Hu, Kreish, and Ormsby, but not in the direction or in the detail that we would sort of need for this sort of thing. So th there are some possibilities here, and I, I don't, I really don't know what the answer would be. But what I do know is that the computations would end up being very interesting. And in fact, I'm kind of tempted to just start computing with this thing anyway, just to see what we get and worry about what it means later. But anyway, okay, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thanks.